All right, you can turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 12. Getting around to the expository study in the book of Revelation this week. Got it all finished up. This is probably the most challenging thing I've ever done um, going through because, you know, I want to, I've been taught by a lot of different great men of God and things over the years, listened to them and things. And, and um, you know, the temptation is always there to exposit the book of Revelation, you know, the way I've been taught and, and uh, you know, according to what's going to happen. And to go through it with, with the uh, thing of saying, okay, what can we learn as Christians today? Uh, you know, applying these chapters for instruction in righteousness for a Christian, it's challenging. I kind of thought at first, oh, this isn't going to be that hard. and <laughs> It's a lot harder than I thought. I mean, I'm going through reading these chapters numerous times over and over and over and over and over again and just like lord you know show me something here so it's an interesting study i know a lot of you have this has probably gotten these the series of studies has gotten a lot of positive feedback a lot of you said i'm really enjoying this study and uh, i'm enjoying it too because i learned some things too from this um, but it's uh it's very challenging <laughs> so it's it's definitely neat to go through Let's start here in verse 1, Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Now, I did the study on the rapture in Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. Um, I'm not going to be getting into some of the same details here, so we're going to talk a little bit about a few different things. But I said in my other study that there are three possibilities to who this woman is. Okay, First of all, you have Mary being the queen of heaven. You'll see these depictions of Mary, these statues. She's got the moon, a crescent moon underneath her feet. I said in one of my studies it looked like she was standing on top of a Pringles potato chip, you know. But, uh, just my weird sense of humor. But um, you, you'll see that, and then she's got the 12 stars kind of going around her head like this. Okay, that's one possibility. Second possibility is it's the church. Old Testament Israel became New Testament Christianity. Replacement theology, in other words, that's what Catholicism teaches. And number three, you have the nation of Israel. Of course, that's the true interpretation of this. Not the Gentile church mixed with Jews from the first century and some Jews that have gotten saved since then, and that's now the Israel. No, 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 no. It's the nation of Israel in geographic Israel. Not a bunch of black people running around in America calling themselves the true Jews or a bunch of dumb white people going running around calling themselves the true Jews. Okay, no. It's the people that are in Israel right now, the Jews that speak Hebrew. Okay, the ones that are, you know, prophesied to come back in unbelief. But uh, let's look here. I'm going to show you this thing about the Queen of Heaven. If you've never seen these verses, it's kind of interesting. Go back to Jeremiah, back to your Old Testament, back to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 44. And uh, if you're a Catholic, you need to think about some of this stuff. Jeremiah 44, we'll begin in verse 15. It says here, Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods, and all the women that stood by, a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt in Pathros, answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. Yeah. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done we and our fathers our kings and our princes in the cities of judah and in the st streets of jerusalem and for then had we plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil but since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. And when we burn incense to the queen of heaven, and pour out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her, and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? So this is predominantly a feministic system. And if you look at Roman Catholicism, it's predominantly women that are in the thing. They make up the largest you know, majority of the people that go to the Catholic Church, the Catholic system. And, you know, I've seen videos of Catholics, you know, there's one... Uh, uh, Catholicism crisis of faith or something I think I don't know if I have it here right now uh, I know I have it on VHS my, I have it on DVD as well I think but uh, I'm not seeing it a lot of the videos are on, in storage right now 
that I have in my collection. But I remember there was this, these Catholics out in front of this Catholic cathedral and people, these people that made the video were interviewing them and they said, what do you think about, you know, Mary and whatever. And she was like, this woman's like, well, I kind of like the fact that Mary, you know, uh, I can go to Mary with my concerns and things. I think she understands me as a woman. You know, I, it's not like I have to go to God the Father and stuff, you know. I kind of like Mary, you know. Mm -hmm. A lot of Catholic women feel that way. And what do they do? Well, you burn incense to her. You know, you actually see the Pope going out and he's got the little incense thing and he's going like this. Show me that in Scripture, you know, in the book of Acts where Peter's doing this. It's not there. Oh, that came later. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> you know, God just kind of didn't really foresee a lot of things to be written into Scripture. He had to wait till later to reveal it to the popes. Sure. But, you know, they burn incense. You have candles lit in front of the Virgin Mary statue, the Queen of Heaven statue, and they call Mary the Queen of Heaven. You'll see that in Catholic writings. So, and they make little cakes to her. It's kind of like the wafer and drink offerings. See, Roman Catholicism is ancient Babylonian paganism. And the practices and worship rituals and things like this go back to ancient Babylon. All right. And you can do the study on it. And it's so funny because Catholics will just vehemently deny it. All that's been disproven. You know, they have uh, this book here, The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. Okay. And they'll say, oh, that's, that was a Protestant propaganda. It's been disproven. It's been disproven. The guy renounced it. You know, Alexander Hislop, he came out and he, and, you know, we've had people disprove it and things like this. No, they haven't. You know, uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs was all a lie. There weren't that many Protestants killed. There were, there were some, but not. They'll deny everything. Okay, they deny truth. Had a sister actually send me a thing here. You can go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5 now. Had a sister send me this article about uh, this Catholic priest. He's a Catholic priest now, but he was Anglican and, a, you know, something else before that, Protestant, you know. And now he's a defender of the Catholic faith and a uh, priest now. And, and uh, he was denying all this connections to Babylonianism and sun worship and stuff like this. Ha, ha, ha. It's all just a ri ridiculous lie. You know, I mean, you can show them the truth and they just go, it's all a lie. There, I proved you wrong. Because I said it's a lie. It's wrong. <laughs> it's like, okay, you know, I can see this stuff working itself out. You know, I can see the fact that you're making round wafers and elevating it slowly and you put it in the monstrance, it's, it's Baal worship. I can see it. It's right in front of my face. Now, oh, no. It's just... Don't confuse Catholics with the truth, okay, with facts. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 5. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Now, we saw that back in Jeremiah 44. They're saying, look, we're worshiping the Queen of Heaven, and when we do, good things happen. So how could it be bad? You know, God wouldn't be prospering us if it was bad. So, you know, supposing that gain is godliness. See? What do you do? Well, from such withdrawal thyself. Get away from them. You say, your practice is condemned in Scripture. But God's blessing us. You know, you're supposing that gain is godliness. You know, and the pagan people there in Jeremiah 44, they were saying that, their God, lowercase g, God, or God S, I should say, they were saying that we're blessed, you know, she's blessing us with all these things. Um, it's not God's blessing. Riches and wealth and things like that uh, and peaceful times and things, those are just temporary little things that you have there where God's mercy and grace is there and His judgment will come. God will only bless those people who truly worship Him in spirit and in truth. All right? So, watch out for this thing of the Roman Catholics saying that, you know, that's the Queen of Heaven. Yeah, watch out for that. Go back to Revelation chapter 12. If you want to get a Catholic all worked up, you know, just show them when they say, we, you know, you say to them, you know, do you believe that uh, Mary is the Queen of Heaven? And they say, oh, yes, she's the Queen of Heaven. She's the Mother of God. <laughs> say, okay, well, let me show you the Queen of Heaven in the Bible. You know, take them back to Jeremiah 44. All right. Verse 2. Revelation chapter 12, verse 2. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. All right. Now, from here, let me just read verses 3 through 6 because we went through this in the other study. Verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. 
and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was called up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Okay, so if you want to hear all the stuff on that, how there's the rapture there, you can see it specifically in verse 5, uh, being called up to God and to his throne. Revelation chapter 4, John called up to God and to his throne. You know, Acts chapter 1, where Jesus is taken up into heaven, there's nothing about him going to the throne. So he is the child that was born, that's to rule all, na all nations with a rod of iron. That's true. But we are part of his body. We've received a spirit of adoption. So uh, interesting study there on the rapture in Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. So watch that study for more detail. I'm not going to go over it all again here. A lot of scriptures to cover there. But uh, let's continue. Verse 7 and 8. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. All right. Important thing to remember, Satan has angels. So you get these people and they say, I saw an angel, you know, this old TV show that used to be on. I don't watch television, haven't in uh, probably since 2001, um, right around the time I got saved and uh, I quit television so shortly thereafter, you know, being saved. But, uh, yeah, I remember um, they had this show, Touched by an Angel. And it was like this, you know, women love to watch the show and they get the little box of tissues and, oh, it's so, so, you know, sad and whatever, <laughs> you know. And it, touched by an angel, oh, there's angels and angels and stuff like this. And you get all these people, you know, angels are everywhere and, uh, you know, angels and stuff. You better be real careful messing around with angels. Why? Because Satan has some, you know. And a little bit later on here, we're going to read in... Uh, where is it here? Uh, trying to see where the verse is. We'll get to it here in just a little bit. I'm just kind of skimming with my eyes. He takes a third of the angels with him. He calls the, the stars of heaven there. Okay, verse 4. I was thinking we were going to get to it, but actually, no, it's verse 4. His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and to cast them to the earth, talking about angels. So a third of the angels are on Satan's side. And now this is a future event, sure. But the point is, you know, there's already a lot of angels that are rebelling against the Lord in heaven before God's throne. So, you know, just want to give a little admonition there to watch out for this thing of angels. All right. But a uh, very instructive thing here um, about the devil being there in heaven. Turn back to Job. You might not have ever heard this before. You might be kind of scratching your head going, but I thought the devil lived in hell. Well, that's where Hollywood has him living, but that's not what the Bible teaches. Uh, the devil's never been to hell. He will one day, but he doesn't want to go there. He doesn't sit on some throne down there in the flames, you know, just kind of sitting there watching all the people burning in hell. That's not the devil. That is a figment of an artist's imagination. Job chapter 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Sons of God in the Old Testament is always, 100% of the time, always a reference to angels. Okay? Always. Uh, <clears throat> verse 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Okay? Go over to chapter 2. Job chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Okay? Very important for you to remember as a Christian. Satan reports before God. Okay, is that somebody who's equal in authority or a subordinate? Subordinate. That's not somebody who's like, you know, you see these, these images of like the devil and God fighting each other. Uh-uh. 
The devil is a created being, and he is submissive to the authority and power of Almighty God. So the devil comes in, it's like roll call, you know, kind of thing, and they all stand there and stuff, and it's like, you know, I don't know, I don't, the Lord probably doesn't have to read a list and stuff, you know, uh, Michael, here, you know, Gabriel, here, Satan, here, you know, <laughs> no, I don't think that that has to be, but the whole point is he has to come before God, before his throne, and stand there, and the Lord says, hey, whence comest thou? I'm going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it, you know. <laughs> I want to give out more information. It doesn't have to because God sees everything he does. I mean, you know, it's just like kind of kooky nonsense, this this mindset that a lot of people have that Satan is just this like, oh man, like this really powerful guy and, and the Lord's this really powerful guy and they're just warring against each other. God's in control of everything. Absolutely everything. Kind of makes you wonder why anybody want to worship the devil. You're worshiping a subservient loser. And I realize he's very powerful in things, and the devil can destroy anybody if the Lord allows him. But uh, why would anybody want to worship Lucifer, Satan? It's rather stupid. Verse 9. And by the way, as I've said in other studies, again, if you haven't heard this, um, we're going to see this. So, again, a very, very weird thing. You think to yourself, you know... Um, you know, uh, the, the old hymn I'm thinking of right now, it's, you know, uh, What joy, O oh delight, should we go without dying? No sickness, no sadness, no dread, and no crying. Called up through the clouds with our Lord into glory when Jesus receives his own. You know, and you think about that and it's like, Oh, Lord Jesus, how long, how long? Ere we shout the glad song, Christ returneth, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, amen, you know. And you think, wow, it's going to be so neat to get there and we'll be with the saints and everything and we're going to be with, ever with the Lord. That's true. But remember, the devil's going to be there too. So we're going to get there and we're just going to be like having a good time and stuff and go in there before the throne and it's just like, this is great. And you look over and there's this grumpy guy standing there. You know, you go, that's the devil, isn't he? The Lord's going to be like, yep, there he is. The Lord's going to be like, hi. <laughs> you know? And as time goes by, he's going to have to watch the judgment seat of Christ, I believe, you know, and then, and, uh, and then it's going to be like, you know, the attitudes are going to swell and eventually there's going to be a fight picked. And the devil's going to get kicked out and his angels with him. Bye-bye. Go down to the earth. Verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. There's no question about who this is, in other words. Which deceiveth the whole world. And he, was, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Again, you want a proof text proving that angels are called stars in the Bible? Right there, his angels are cast out with him. Go up to verse 4. Uh, you know, his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. You know, angels are stars. If you don't believe that, well, you're just not comparing Scripture with Scripture. But uh, what about this thing of deceiving the whole world? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. actually going to be kind of enjoyable when you think about it, really, you know, like, it, we'll get there to heaven, and it isn't going to be just, like, all, like, wonderful and everything, it's going to be like, ah, there's the devil, ha, huh. and we're going to get to see him, you know, having to report before the Lord and stuff, and, and being submissive to the Lord, and the Lord's going to look at us, and he's going to say, see, I had it under control the whole time, down there worried about Satan and his, and his foe, or his little buddies and stuff like this, he submits to me, you know, and it could be that part of the humiliation that Satan is going to have is the Lord could humiliate him in front of the whole body of Christ just to show his power. And the devil's going to get so angry, he's going to be like, and he's going to pick a fight, and he's going to get kicked out of heaven. And we're going to be up there throwing a party about it. Good times. Good times ahead. Looking forward to it. Verse 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Okay, talking about lost people here. In whom 
the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The Bible said in Revelation chapter 12, Satan deceiveth the whole world. Here it says that he is the God of this world, and he's blinded the minds of them which believe not. You know, it, it's like, it's, it's, it's so insane. I mean, you look and you see all the signs and everything of the times and the Bible being fulfilled just in daily news and, and earthquakes and pestilences and, you know, all this other stuff going on, wars, rumors of wars and things. And you're just going like, how can't people see this? Why? Well, because the devil has a lot of distractions out there in the world. And he's worked very hard to, uh, to deceive people. You know, to give them, to educate them in the wrong way. You know, um, it's just incredible that people can't see it. It's just like it's just right before your eyes. I mean, it's just right there. And yet you have lost people. They just can't see it. You try to exp explain it to them and you're just like, you're talking another language to these people. I know we had a letter from a, a sister, a friend of the ministry. And um, she was saying, you know, she's just like, I, I can't even relate to people. You know, it's it's just like these people are totally, it's like they're a different, I hate to say it, but a different species or something. And you know? it's just like, you know, people are so interested in all this deception, you know, uh, selling their soul, trading their soul in eternity for cell phones and computers and fancy cars and expensive houses and vacations to Disneyland or something like this. And you're going, don't you understand what's going on? You know, it's incredible. What happens when the devil comes down to the earth? Revelation chapter 12. Go back to Revelation chapter 12. Go to verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser, accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Okay. Satan knows once you are saved, his, he can't take you out of God's hand. All right. As a Christian today, he can't take you out of God's hand. All right. And this is why I know what's going on here in Revelation chapter 12. It's talking about events on the earth. Sure, the woman there, Israel, but the child there that's called up to heaven is Jesus Christ and the body of Christ there. They're one and the same, all right, up in heaven. And we're there now. Satan can't accuse us anymore. And so the Lord says there's no more court battle, so to speak, up there. The devil realizes, hey, right now the devil realizes I can't, destroy a Christian's salvation, but I can get them to mess up. I can get them to mess around in sin, right? Uh, see, see, true salvation, I'll be talking about this as we continue, true salvation is that you get saved according to the gospel presented in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. His blood washes your sins away, absolutely, and it changes your life, and you will have a changed life now. But the devil, all he can do from that point on is try to get you to mess up and mess around in sin so that he can accuse you before God and he can get you into bad situations where God has to punish you. Because see, if God doesn't punish you, the devil says, hey, look, doesn't your word say, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes? But that you know, Christian right down there, look at them, they're on the internet right now, they're looking at pornography. And I have records of that over at the NSA. And I could bring that thing out and make you look really bad, God, unless you do something about this. You know? You're not going to let them go, are you? I mean, you destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah way back when. Are you going to let them go? They're looking at the same thing. They're saying it's entertainment. You see? He will accuse Christians because that's all he can do. And God will punish you as a good father. Would his child. I mean... I have a son now. Uh, I can understand some aspects of God the Father now that I didn't understand before. I love my son very dearly. And I just want to be there and I just want to do good things for my son. But there are some times he just gets downright ornery and, and just naughty. And there's nothing that I can do except punish him. In spite of not wanting to. I know if I don't punish him, 
he's going to come out worse. And I have to teach him, no, son, don't do that. And you do it again, that he's going to have to spank you. All right? And God the Father is the same way with us. He'll tell you. God will warn you sometimes when you're sinning. And you'll get that conviction of the Holy Spirit saying, you're wrong and you know it. Quit. Stop. You need to stop doing this. Well, yeah, I know, but I'm just I'm kind of tempted here. And I, I mean, if I just do it one more time, and the Lord says, you better not. I'm going to have to, you know, Daddy's going to have to spank you. See? And the reason, one of the reasons for that is because the devil's up there in heaven going, see, oh, oh, look, 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 look what they just did. Look what they just did. But it's going to be over when we get up there to be with the Lord. He's, the accuser of the brethren is cast down. And again, you know, I get called the, the accuser of the brethren because I point out false prophets and stuff like this. I'm like, do you realize what you're calling me to some of these people out there? I mean, disagree with me. That's fine. You know, I probably disagree with you in some things, but you know, calling me the accuser of the brethren. I mean, I'm the devil. You know, I got a YouTube channel here at Husky 394 XP with less, less than 20,000 subscribers, but I'm the devil. Uh, don't you think the devil might be a little bit more popular than me? Just maybe. I mean, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Uh, he deceives the whole world. But I'm the devil with my puny little channel, you know. Some people. Verse 11, Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Notice the three things here. And they overcame him. Who's it talking about? Verse 12. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. The brethren. Which accused them, the brethren there, before God day and night. And they, the brethren, saved Christians that are there in heaven, overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. You say, well, brother, that's talking about the, the saints in the time of Jacob's trouble. Sure, it'll be true for them too. But if you're truly saved, you have experienced the same thing. The blood of the Lamb. Let's look at that. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which He... God hath purchased with his, God, still in context, own blood. The blood that Jesus shed on the cross was God's blood. It was eternal. It wasn't like my blood or your blood. All right? The life of the flesh is in the blood, you see. My flesh is, the life in it is my blood. You take my blood away, I'm not going to be going very far. <laughs> okay? Jesus Christ, his life that was in his flesh was God's blood. It was eternal blood. That's why it's able to take your sins away. You see. So we as Christians can overcome the devil saying things about us by the blood of the Lamb. We are purchased by that blood. You see it right there. Okay? So it's not that, you know, well, my, the blood of, of Jesus Christ is kind of there and, and uh, you know, it's just kind of like I, I have kind of a hold of it somehow and, and, you know, and the devil can knock it out of my hands and then I've lost it or something because of sin. Oh, no, 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 no. The blood was shed to purchase you. you read Ephesians chapter 1 sometime. You know, I have a whole expository study on Ephesians chapter 1. You can watch that. Okay. That blood was shed to purchase us. We are the purchased possession of Almighty God. That's a thought. Okay? Um, go to 1 John chapter 1. First John chapter 1. Another good scripture text to prove that you are bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Past sins, present sins, future sins. His righteousness is imputed to us. 
you say, wow, all my sins are forgiven, then I can live in sin. Well, as I've said in other studies, that's really quite stupid to say I can live in sin. Sin is negative. I mean, it's like saying I can take a hammer and hit myself in the face because it's not going to make me lose my salvation, so I can do that. It'd be, it'd be good. No, you don't hit yourself in the face with a hammer. Right? It's negative. If you go and you look at pornography, it's going to mess up your mind. Looking at pornography does not make you better and stronger. If you eat junk food, right, it's not going to make you stronger. It's going to ruin your health. You're going to be sick. You're going to have headaches. You're going to have sugar highs, sugar lows, all kinds of other issues. You're going to get cancer eventually, diabetes, whatever. Right? You smoke cigarettes. You're going to get emphysema, lung cancer. You drink alcohol, cirrhosis of the liver. Not to mention it's extremely expensive. Okay? And most alcohol today is synthetic. It's not even, you know, good fermented types of grape juice and things like that. There's arguments for that. I understand that. Even some of the uh, beers that are made correctly, like I know over in Germany and things, I've, I've heard about this, that they have like wheat and they, you know, make these wheat beers and things and they use yeast and stuff and whatever. And you can get ones that are fairly, you know, like fermented and stuff. And you can argue it back and forth, whatever. I don't drink alcohol for any reason because it's just, I don't need it. You know, it's not a cultural thing for me as far as the way I was raised. But whatever. Like I said, I'm not going to get into that big debate. But there's things that are out there that the Bible condemns. The Bible does condemn drunkenness. Um, there are things that are out there that you mess with. It will mess with your flesh. And it's going to make your life more miserable. So when I say Jesus Christ has forgiven all of your sins, past, present, future, that doesn't give you license to sin. That gives you freedom, understanding there's nothing I can do to make myself lose this salvation. I am God's purchased possession. So I don't have to worry about being saved anymore. God saved me. He's purchased me with His blood. All right. Now I can go out and I can clean up my life and I can try to do whatever I can so I can live a good life. Okay? Go to Philippians chapter 3. They were came in by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Let's see about that. Colossians chapter, excuse me, Philippians chapter 3. I moved my card down there. Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 3. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Do you have confidence in the flesh when you get saved? No, because you're not part of the salvation equation. All right, all you got to do is just come to the Lord as sinner, as a sinner. You come and you say, "I'm no good." Jesus didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So you get to that point of repentance, and you say, "God, have mercy on me, a sinner." There you go. You're ready for salvation. You don't have any confidence in your flesh. You don't say, "Well." I understand that all of sin, but I mean, I'm okay, I'm a sinner, but I'm not like as bad as Hitler. Or I'm not as bad as some other people. I've never killed anybody. You know, again, when I used to go out door to door, that's what we get all the time. Uh, if you die today, would you go to heaven or hell? I think I'd go to heaven. Why? Well, I'm a pretty good person. I mean, I've never killed anybody. I've never robbed a bank. They have confidence in their flesh. They cannot imagine standing before a holy, perfect, righteous God and having the God say, having that God say to them, depart from me, ye cursed. You know, into everlasting fire. Oh, no, not me. Cursed? I'm a good person. I've done some good things. I mean, there was this old woman the one time at the grocery store. I helped her put her bags in, the, in her car. and I, I've done some good things. You know, see? They have confidence in the flesh. As a Christian, you have no confidence in the flesh. You get to that point where you get saved and you go, Man, I am such a rotten individual. My word. I sure am glad Jesus died on the cross and paid for my sins because I sure could not do it on my own. If I had to do something to merit salvation, I'd never make it. Never. Verse 4, Philippians 3, 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more, Paul speaking here, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. A lot of people say, well, that's not possible. Oh, sure it was possible. You could be righteous according to the law and be actually blameless under the law in the Old Testament. 
You say, how so? I don't understand. You can't keep the law. There was a system of sacrifices there to pay for your sins. As far as, you know, making restitution and things like that, your sins couldn't be taken away until the perfect sacrifice of the Lamb of God happened, Jesus Christ. But you could make payment for your sins under the Old Testament system, much like Roman Catholicism today. You go in and the guy says, well, you know, I kind of, you know, was at the bar, you know, hey, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. And he says, oh, what did you do this time? You say, well, you know, I was at the bar the other night. My wife doesn't know about this. And there was this blonde at the end of the bar. And well, we went back to her place and the priest says, yeah, I, I understand there. Okay, well, put some money in the box out there and we'll have you do a little bit of penance and things like this. And we'll just kind of forget the whole thing. We'll give you a little indulgence, you know, if the uh, price is right. See? The people in the Old Testament were abusing the system. That's why when Jesus Christ showed up, He's saying, you're whited sepulchers. You appear outward to be righteous, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. Mm -hmm. That's what Paul was doing. Paul was a trained, he was trained under the learned Gamaliel. You study about that in the book of Acts. You know, this, I mean, Paul was a very, very highly educated, you know, he'd have been like a, you know, very... I don't know if they have PhDs in Judaism or whatever. You know, I mean, they do if you go to a secular university. But I'm saying different levels of rabbi. You know, I don't know if you have arch rabbi or cardinal rabbi or pope rabbi. But you know, but the point is, you know, you Paul was very high ranking within the circles of Judaism back in the first century before he got saved. So yes, he could be blameless under that Old Testament system. But look what he says here about all that stuff of his credentials from his past. Verse 7, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless. And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. You know, that's the decision you have to make when you come to the Lord for salvation. You have to look at your old life and you have to say, Am I willing to cut ties with all that? I don't even know what all the Lord's going to require of me. But you know what? All that stuff from my past, my good deeds and my good things and all the nice little connections and friends and whatever else, acquaintances I had, I'll leave all that stuff behind. Lord, if you save me, my life is yours. I don't even know what all that means yet. But save me. Please, please, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And you know what? After you get saved and, and you see what the Lord does for you and how He changes your life, you'll look back at your previous lost life and you go, I count all things but dung that I may win Christ. I look back over my past and I say, all the professional wood-turning stuff and, and uh, the fact I cooked for the governor of Pennsylvania one time as a, when I was working as a chef and... and uh, you know, my motorcycle mechanic training and all the fast cars and motorcycles and all the stuff, you know, you say, would you be willing to leave what you have now for that? <laughs> for that dung? I don't think so. You know what I'm talking about out there if you're saved. There's nothing from that lost life that would tempt you to leave what you have right now in spite of the suffering, in spite of the hard times, in spite of the depression, in spite of whatever you're going through, there's nothing that would draw you back to the way it used to be before you got saved. Not one thing. Let me prove it to you. Second Corinthians. Oh, let me read verse 9 there. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, I was going to read that. And be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And we are saved by grace through faith. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll be talking about that in another video. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 through 11. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. 
Okay? That's true salvation. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of. You will never turn against the Lord after you've gotten saved. You can backslide. I've seen that. Right? There's been times I've backslidden in my life. There's been times I've messed around with sin that I know I should, knew I shouldn't have been doing. And I've gotten very far away from the Lord. I've dealt with Christians for years and years and years. You put this book down for even a couple of days. And I'm telling you right now, if you have no contact with this book for a couple of days, you will find it is almost impossible to go back to it again. Oh, yeah. You get out of praying. You start to listen to the wrong kind of music. You start to watch television. You start to do some things that are worldly. And it's going to seem like an impossible task to get back to where you once were. You left your first love. Talks about an early part of the book of Revelation. You know, did other studies on that. So it's very difficult. Okay. But even in your most backslidden state, to say, would you reject Jesus Christ and say that the whole thing was a lie and there is no God and whatever else, a truly saved Christian will say, no way. I want to get back to being with the Lord. I miss that fellowship that I've had with the Lord. And I'm so messed up right now. And oh, brother, would you please pray for me? I'm just, I just feel like my whole world's crashing down. I just want that fellowship again. To leave the Lord? No. No, not going to happen. You know, but what will happen after you get truly saved, after there's that real true conversion, you're going to experience verse 11. For behold, the self same thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. See, there's two types of repentance in verse 10. Let me say that before we get to verse 11. You have godly sorrow, work with repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. The second type is the sorrow of the world, and it works death. Somebody gets caught for doing something wicked. And they go, I'm sorry, I need to apologize. You know, some Hollywood celebrity, you see this all the time with them. They get drunk, they get on drugs, they do some kind of wicked thing and whatever else. Oh, I'm sorry. They're only sorry because they got caught. And you'll see them if they get sorry enough, if there's enough sorrow there, if they really, really messed up, all of a sudden you'll find out they committed suicide. Okay, there was some country singer, I can't even remember what her name is now, but uh, I said years and years ago, she was like, you know, she tried to overdose. She tried to commit suicide by overdosing on antidepressants. That real good, you know, advertisement there for antidepressants, you know. And uh, she did it again. A couple years later, I said, she's going to kill herself. You can listen to my old studies, and, and I said, she's going to kill herself eventually. And she did. She finally, they she went out to some cabin someplace, her and her boyfriend's dog or something. She shot the dog, and then she blew her brains out. Big country singer. What'd she have? Worldly sorrow. She didn't have godly sorrow. She didn't say, I've sinned against God. She said, I've messed up my life. See? Those are the two different types of repentance there. But verse 11, this is, there are so many scriptures in the Pauline epistles that say, this is how you differentiate between real conversion and false conversion. And here's another one, verse 11. For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. Was the salvation real? Here's what will follow. What carefulness had wrought in you. All of a sudden you're going to be thinking about, I don't want to get back into those sins, those things I repented of. i got to have help getting away from this thing. It'll make you careful. Sins that before never bothered you, all of a sudden you're going to start be going, you know, I need to be careful. I don't mess around with that stuff again. What clearing of yourselves you depart from that iniquity there you say hey you know what i got to get away from this thing i'm saved now i'm born again i got to get away from that and you see some old buddy and you go hey you know buddy can you come out to the bar tonight you say i'm not doing that anymore oh come on what are you talking about you busy or something i'm a christian now i'm saved you're a christian oh god they laugh at you and stuff yeah, I had a, my best friend growing up. He laughed at me the one time. He said, what are you up to? I said, studying the Bible. He laughed at me. Well, with the kind of life I was living before I got saved, I could see why he laughed at me. But the point is, I cleared myself. I said, I'm changed now. Jesus Christ truly saved me. I'm no longer counting on some little experience I had as a child in Sunday school back when I was going to the Babel building that we were both raised in. I'm changed. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. I cleared myself. I had a, a desire to say, I'm not part of that lost world anymore. I wanted to clear myself. What's the third one? What indignation? 
all of a sudden you're going to find yourself getting mad about what goes on in the lost world. And those things whereby people are being deceived and you go, this isn't right. And you look at false religion and you say, wait a second, you people are lying. This speaking in tongues thing, that's not what was going on in the book of Acts. That's not what was going on in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14. You're a liar. How dare you deceiving people? Indignation. You look at Roman Catholicism and you see these priests molesting these children. It's called satanic ritual abuse is why they do that thing. Because it messes up their mind. The catechism teaches the priest is another Christ. And they're being raped by Christ. You see what it does to the mind of a child? It destroys them. And it, what does it do to you as a Christian? It gives you indignation. You say, how dare these stinking Catholic priests do this? I can't believe this. You see him, you know, I saw one recently. He's raping children and stuff like this. And the Pope said he condemned him to, you know, he sentenced him to a life of prayer. Like that's a punishment. You know, some dirty, stinking pedophile priest and he's sentenced to a life of prayer. See? Indignation. I'm demonstrating. What fear... The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the Bible says. You'll start to fear God. You don't fear God very much when you're lost. Okay? You'll find ways to, to weasel around and do your sins and stuff like this. You'll, if you're a Catholic, you go to the right priest. You know, the, it's not too tough on certain sins when you go into the confessional. Uh, you'll find ways to skirt systems and things like that. But you get saved and all of a sudden you start going, I'm accountable to God. Hmm. Ugh. I'm going to have to answer for taking this action or doing this or doing that. What fear? What's the next one? Yea, what vehement desire. Did you have a desire for this book when you were lost? No. Did you have a desire to listen to the right kind of hymns? No. Did you have a desire for truth? Just nonstop? I mean, I, I can't tell you how many people have contacted me over the years and said, you know, they've learned a lot from me. Praise the Lord. I thank, I thank the Lord for that. And it's just like, I just like listen to like 10 hours, 12 hours of, of preaching, you know, you and a couple other brothers and stuff. And it's just like, I listen to 10 or 12 hours a day. <laughs> you know, it's just like, yeah, you know, everywhere you go, it's like, I want to hear another sermon. You just, you get online, you're like, I got to do some emailing and stuff, but I want to hear some sermon. I want to hear some preaching. And I just, that's all I want to do anymore. You'll go through that time period. All right. Vehement desire. But you see these Christians and stuff, and it's just like you talk to them, and it's just all about the world and the weather and sports. And did you see the Super Bowl? And hey, did you see that new 2018 uh, Chevy truck that they're coming out with? I don't really like the style of it. And blah, 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 blah. You say, hey, you know what? The Bible, I was, I was looking through the Bible, and I saw this thing. Isn't it amazing? This right here condemns Roman Catholicism. And he'll go, yeah, well, that's interesting. Anyways, well, it's nice talking to you. Isn't it? They don't have the vehement desire to serve the Lord. They don't have passion for truth. And that's why a lot of times, you know, you see me do studies and I'm, I'm condemning something and stuff. And I'm like, the Lord showed us where the, the roots of this thing is or whatever. And I say, if you don't feel this way, you might want to check and see if you're saved. The reason I'm saying that is because if you don't have the vehement desire there, there are certain things that should mean something to you as a Christian. And if you don't have that vehement desire there, if you don't have that passion for truth, I say, just make sure you're saved. I'm not saying, I'm not condemning everybody and going, you're lost, you're lost, you're lost. I, I'm the only one that's in this system and only a few of my viewers on YouTube, people say that about me, which is a satanic lie, you know, that like I don't want other people to be saved. No, I just dedicated my life to serving the Lord and trying to get as many people saved as I can. But true salvation... I'm never ever going to lead people in false professions of faith. It's disgusting. Yea, what zeal? Are you zealous for the things of the Lord? You should be. I mean, I could say a whole lot on that. But uh, what revenge? You know, well, you know, the Bible says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Yes, that's true. Very true. That's talking about people doing you wrong personally. But when you're done wrong by systems, wickedness and things out there in the world, you should get revenge on them. See, that Catholic church, they brainwashed me all those years. I'm going to start a ministry. Ex-Catholics for Christ. 
two very fine brothers here on YouTube. You say, well, brother, they did. we're never going to agree on every little fine point of doctrine and stuff like this. Don't go searching through James and Patrick Patel's YouTube ministry and stuff. Those guys are doing good work for the Lord, all right? Uh, James and I have, have uh, you know, we've had a few little things over the years and stuff like that, but I'm just like, I can look at James and I'm like, he's doing great work for the Lord. Those guys are out on the streets. They're out there putting their faith into practice. I respect both men very highly, James and his father, Patrick. They do a good job, okay? I'm not going to pick apart his ministry. He doesn't pick apart mine. He's got his ministry. He does his thing. They have a, a radio program and stuff like that too. Praise the Lord for those two brothers. I thank the Lord for him, okay? David Daniels, I'm sure I could find some things, you know, I could pick at him and stuff like that, but I'm not going to. He's doing work for the Lord, all right? Doing great work for the Lord. He's exposing the whole Sinaiticus thing, or Sinaiticus, however you want to say the dumb thing, uh, pagan uh, manuscript that's used in the new versions. Uh, Kudix uh, Aleph is what it's called of the designation there. And he's picking that thing apart, showing, hey, this, this thing's just, it's a forgery. It's not even real. And all these new versions. Oh, we found older and better manuscripts. No, you found a forgery, you know, that was made in the 19th century, essentially. But tremendous work, okay? Those guys came out of systems that now they're turning against those systems. They have revenge. James and Patrick Battelle were both Roman Catholic. Now they have ex-Catholics for Christ. You see? Revenge. They're going against those systems that once deceived them. David Daniels, he's going against the system of Alexandrian scholarship that once brainwashed him to be against the King James Bible. Now he defends it. You see, a changed life is part of true conversion. Finishing the verse, in all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Do you have to approve yourself as a Christian? Well, not in America, because in America, you can just say you're a Christian and everybody just, oh, that's wonderful. And everything. But you go to some country where uh, being a Christian gets you killed. Um, you better start to approve people when they come and they want to be part of your group. When they want to come and fellowship with you, you have to ask them some questions. That was a practice we had when we had our house church, Bible Believers Fellowship, down in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. We had numerous people come along. We had this guy come the one time, we called him Crazy Charlie, and uh, we met him out in a public place and things, and, uh, you know, myself and Brother Jesse Dolesky, and and uh, we're sitting down with the guy, and he was, oh, I want to join your house church, you know, and I want to, you know, really excited to be part of your fellowship and everything else, and it was just like, I was going, just like the Holy Spirit was going, no, 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 and I'm like, Okay, well, you know, what do you believe about this? What do you believe about that? And it was just like I got this really weird feeling around the guy. It turned out he was a total heretic. I mean, he was into all kinds of weird stuff. He was a heroin addict and all kinds. I mean, he was he was warped with a capital W. And he was he was coming out calling himself the worm and the worm is here to rebuke you, you wicked false prophet, you know, after I told him no, you're not going to be part of it. I mean, I flat out told him to his face, "No, sorry. You can't be part of our fellowship." Oh, you got some major issues and things. And he just went whew, off the other direction. <laughs> you know. Um, so uh, he didn't approve himself. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's a lot of ministries. You can go back to... Um, okay, go to uh, Philippians next. Let me finish up my point here. Um, there's a lot of ministries here on YouTube that have not approved themselves. And uh, they're... They started out acting like Bible believers, and then they come out and they get weirder and weirder and weirder and weirder, and you know, and then they'll, and then their disciples will come to me and they'll say, "I hate to see you changing your stance. You're really starting to fall away from the truth." I'm going, I'm preaching the same stuff that I preached way back in 2008 when I first was starting to come onto YouTube. 2009, I really started to do a lot of ministry stuff. I preached the same things. I still preach repentance to salvation. I still preach that there are false converts that just do this easy believism thing or that go to the other side of lordship salvation where they're saying you have to be sinlessly perfect and then God grants you repentance and then salvation. You know, this hyper-Calvinism stuff. You know, I mean, I still preach the same gospel. But I see these people, you're really starting to fall away. What's going on? Well, they're not approved. 
not because I want to single them out and, and not you're not part of my system or something. I want people to be saved. But I see these people, they go off. You know, First John talks about the thing of, uh, you know, the spirit of Antichrist. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. And I've seen that thing over the years. I used to endorse a lot of ministries. I don't anymore. At one point, I was endorsing uh, Mike Hoggard. You know, and then he came out totally against eternal security. He used to be, I had, I had a video, it's in my collection, of him uh, defending the pre-trib rapture. Now he comes out vehemently against the pre-trib rapture. He's against dispensational teaching. The guy's gone totally off. Why? What's, what's going on? He's not approved. And we as Christians have to approve ministries that are out there. 